Libertarianism is pro-immigration, pro-market, pro-trade. More competitive, less centralized. Not military confrontations, but peaceful interaction. The war on drugs has been actually an unmitigated disaster. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Alex Pilkington. I serve as the Florida State Coordinator for Students for Liberty. And I won't be the first person to point out that there's a bit of a political divide in this country. Having witnessed the political atmosphere grow increasingly hostile and divisive in the past couple years, my friends and I have hoped for a way to promote the discussion of political differences in a calm and civilized manner. In proposing this event to the College Republicans, College Democrats, and Eagles for Liberty, I had hoped to address this issue. With their help, I considered it an honor to be able to say that we did it. Tonight, there are people from all over the political spectrum in one room engaging in a civil debate about our ideological differences. With elections around, we tend to isolate ourselves further into our partisan circles but I hope at the end of tonight's debate, we can all leave here having learned something new about those we disagree with. I'd like to preface this debate by saying that this is not about candidates or campaigns. Tonight is not about political parties. Tonight isn't about Trump versus Hillary, nor Rick Scott versus Bill Nelson. Tonight is about ideas. What ideology can take us in the right direction? Is it the conservative ideology? Is it the progressive ideology, or is it the libertarian ideology? After tonight, I hope we can say we're one step closer to answering that question. As an institute of higher education, Florida Gulf Coast University serves as a place where students come to not only learn, but to challenge their held beliefs and grow as critical thinkers. Universities should never be places of echo chambers or closed-mindedness. And we are very appreciative that our school can be a catalyst to returning to civil discussion and debate with those we fundamentally disagree with. Without taking up too much more time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening. Dr. Mohamed Al-Hakim is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Philosophy at Florida Gulf Coast University. He holds an Honor Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts from McMaster University and completed his Doctorate of Philosophy at York University in Toronto, Canada. His primary research focuses on political, legal, and moral theory with special focuses on issues of minority rights and justice. Dr. Al-Hakim has taught philosophy, oh, Dr. Al-Hakim has taught courses in legal and political theory, ethics, history of philosophy, logic, and Islamic philosophy. He has also published on various topics including multiculturalism, identity politics, hate crime legislation, and government ethics. Dr. Alakim will go over format and technicalities, as well as introduce the participants for this evening's debate. Good evening. Um, thank you, Alex, for those kind words and important uh, message in today's uh, political uh, framework we're in. Uh, good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, this evening at Florida Gulf Coast University for a special public debate event. My name is Dr. Mohamed al Hakim, and I am an assistant professor at philosophy here at FGCU, and I will be the moderator for this evening's event. Among some of the guiding principles listed in our university's mission statement are the commitment to promoting diversity and helping foster informed and engaged citizens. Our mission statement is further grounded in the promotion of diversity and engaged citizenry in the overarching goal of advancing democratic ideals. If I may, I wish to take a few words here, just a few minutes, to say a few words about democratic ideals as a way of introducing tonight's special event. With the midterm elections just over two weeks away, 
The drumming up of citizens to get out and vote is stronger than ever. This is wonderful and captures an essential procedural element of democracy concerned with ensuring a fair process for resolving political disagreement and contest. The fairness of the process, however, would be somewhat empty without some deeper substantive values informing us of what fairness might entail. I hope it's not too contentious to suggest that it means more than simply resolving the conflict through a coin toss. Although a coin toss does align with our intuitive sense of fairness, it is far removed from what we mean by fairness in the context of democracy. Now I conjecture that this is because democracy is tied to a greater substantive moral values of equality, respect, and concern. That is to say, we value a certain type of democratic process, in this case voting, because we hold dear the ideas of moral equality, the right of one's own conscience and expression, and we respect the freedom of each individual to pursue his or her own chosen conception of the good life. The pluralism and disagreement that results from respecting diversity and moral equality in civil discourse is not to be seen, as the political philosopher John Rawls reminds us, as a disaster, but rather as the natural outcome of the activities of human reason under enduring free institutions. That is to say, our reasonable disagreement is a featured hallmark of our democracy, and the management of diversity and differences are important to maintain in light of our moral disagreement and maintaining our moral integrity and commitment to equality, respect, and concern. Voting is by, is, sorry, voting is certainly a valuable means for deciding, but the spirit of democracy belongs as much to its moral underpinnings than it does to the procedural method we pick. So returning to these important values is essential to the maintenance and growth of democratic states, even if hypothetically speaking, voting systems were perfected to everyone's satisfaction. The importance of civil debate cannot be understated in today's political culture. We seem to have lots of debates these days, but we may be in need of better debates rather than just more. It is in the spirit of this substantive view of democracy that we are holding our special event today, and we bring together three distinguished speakers and debaters to engage on topics of shared interest and intense disagreement. We hope to model the value and the importance of preserving the underlying values of equality and respect through civil engagement on issues that matter to all of us. I would now like to take just a few moments to talk about the rules for, for the audience as well for our invited speakers. For the audience, we ask that you please refrain from interrupting the speakers and debate at all times. We ask that you refrain from clapping, cheering, booing, hissing, and any other general interruptions. The goal is to engage with the substance of the points made and to save discussion for after the event. I will ask you in a few minutes, though, to join me in welcoming our debaters, and I will ask you again at the end of the debate to join me in thanking them. We wish also to let the audience know that there are some students on the side here who will be typing away at computers as they are doing some live fact-checking. We do our best to provide a forum that deals with the merits of the points. In the event that any major facts are misrepresented or misstated, I will highlight them <laughs> at the end of the event. Uh, finally, I ask if you would just take a moment to silence or turn off any cell phone devices or tablets or anything that will make noise during the event. As for our speakers, we have a certain format already established. Just to let you know what that format is, each speaker will be given seven minutes for opening remarks upon which we have three prompt questions. For each prompt question, each speaker will have three minutes to respond. After all three speakers have gone, they will each get two minutes for rebuttals. After we've gone through our three prompts and our three speakers addressing them, we'll end with about a minute and a half each uh, for closing statements. For our speakers, we've picked a random selection for who goes first, and each speaker will have an opportunity for each prompt to go first, so they'll have a fair opportunity at it. I have cards here that will indicate when we have uh, one minute left, and I'll show it again with 30 seconds left, and then there'll be a card for stopping. Um, and if, of course, if necessary, we'll shut off the mics, but there's no need to. <laughs> um, and also, I ask that it be uh, one, speak one speaker at a time 
to hold off uh, your points for rebuttals when it comes to your time. All right, well, tonight's invited debaters are from, all coming from Washington, D.C., but they have worked and uh, studied in various places across the United States and even Canada. Uh, so we are joined by David Azarar from the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Azarar is a director at the B. Kenneth uh, Simon Center for uh, Principles uh, Politics. Uh, he's also AWC Family Foundation Fellow. We also have um, Mr. Ryan Collins from the Center for American Progress. He's the Director of Government Affairs at the Center and works on policy issues relating to education, faith, health, poverty, and transportation. And last but not least, uh, we are also joined by Mr. Matthew Feeney from the Cato Institute. Mr. Feeney is Director on Projects on Emerging Technologies, working on the intersection of new technology and civil liberties. So, all right, well, um, with no further ado, we'd like to now start our live debate. Um, We'll go in the order of closest to me to the end there, uh, as, as designated before, I believe, right, with David uh, going first. So our first prompt for our, th uh, sorry, I don't have a first prompt. Um, we'll now begin with the seven minute open uh, forum with David. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for being here. And thank you to the college Democrats, the college Republicans, and Eagles for Liberty for uh, hosting us. Um, I'm a conservative, and uh, I gotta say, I, I kind of got the short end of the stick on this one. Uh, not because libertarianism or liberalism are preferable to conservatism, they most emphatically are not. Uh, the reason I say I got the short end of the stick is that conservatism is not easy to define, uh, and that so much of what passes for conservatism, especially in the swamp where I live, in Washington, D.C., is really just watered down liberalism. Many conservatives have come to define conservatism as whatever the left wants except a little bit cheaper, or whatever the left of 20 years ago wanted. In Washington, D.C. at least, there is much truth to Robert Louis Dabney's biting observation that American conservatism is merely the shadow that follows radicalism as it moves forward towards perdition. It's also the case that American conservatism is fractious. You got neocons, theocons, and paleocons. Kirkians, Burkeans, and Lockeans. You have traditionalists and constitutionalists, and now, of course, populists and nationalists, which may or may not belong on the right, depending on who you talk to. So which version am I here to defend? Well, as a conservative living in America, I take my bearings from the American family. I am, you could say, an American. As a conservative, I want to conserve the Republican regime of ordered liberty established by our founders. And let me immediately reassure my friends on the left and some members of the audience that when I say that I want to defend the founding, it doesn't mean that I'm defending America as it existed in the late 18th century. America at the time, and for a long time after that, not only fell short of its founding principles, but in the case of slavery, flat out betrayed us. As a conservative, I take my bearings from our founding documents, from the natural rights philosophy of the Declaration of Independence and the Republican framework of government found in the Constitution. And one thing that is readily apparent when you read these documents is that nowhere in the Declaration or in the Constitution are human beings classified according to race, sex, religion, ethnicity, you name it. For the founders, we were first and foremost free individuals who could stand on our own two feet. As Frederick Douglass once said, we believe that men are born with legs, not that they are in need of crutches. Our liberal friends have a tendency to view people, on the one hand, not as being so much individuals as being part of various racial or sexual communities, and then also there's a tendency to view them as being a little bit weak fragile, not capable of providing for themselves, victims, dare I say. Now, libertarians don't make that mistake, but here's the mistake that they do make. They forget that we're not just individuals, we're also Americans. The Declaration of Independence doesn't begin with an affirmation of individual rights. It begins by saying that we are one people that have assumed our separate and equal station amongst the powers of the earth. America is a sovereign country with borders, and we Americans are one people, different and diverse in many ways, it is true, but also bound together by a common language, 